senior resident, Dr. Athir Razouk, will be giving, um, will be talking about relief of chest pain with nitroglycerin, always suggests active coronary artery disease. All right, thank you, Dr. Free. Thank you, everyone, for coming. So uh, for the sake of time, I'll get right into it. So here's the myth. Um, I have nothing to disclose. So in the U.S., chest pain accounts for about 20% of ED visits and hospitalizations annually. Um, it's obviously crucial for these patients to rule out coronary artery disease as the cause of their chest pain. Uh, and each year, about 2 to 8% uh, of patients with acute MIs are actually discharged from the ED. And as you can see, this uh, has a lot of significant adverse clinical outcomes. Uh, so the, that idea, the relief of chest pain with uh, nitroglycerin kind of serves as a diagnostic clue uh, for ED physicians to see how, how much they need to work up and, and triage these patients. Uh, and obviously based on the history and physical exam, uh, it's important to determine typical versus atypical chest pain because again, uh, that guides your treatment. And uh, of note, patients who have relief of chest pain with nitroglycerin are more likely to be uh, admitted and undergo more extensive workup, as we can probably all see why. So in med school, we've been taught uh, the, the criteria for anginal chest pain is, uh, you know, substernal chest pain elicited by exertion or sometimes emotional stress and relieved with uh, rest or nitroglycerin. So this idea of relief with uh, nitroglycerin originated back in the 1980s um, by two doctors, Diamond and Forrester. They worked prior to this in the 70s, uh, coming up with different uh, calculations for sensitivities and specificities of different diagnostic workups for CAD. And uh, they proposed the classification of chest pain uh, and the probability of CAD based on 132 patients that they looked at who later underwent uh, a cardiac cath. And uh, the three questions that they proposed were, one, is the discomfort substernal? And that excludes the epigastric region and the parasternal and transthoracic distribution, unless it also involved the, the substernal region. Uh, is it precipitated by exertion? And even if sometimes, even if not all the time, that, that also counted. And then uh, is there prompt relief with rest or nitroglycerin? And that usually implied a time span of about 30 seconds to 10 minutes. So if patients had all three questions, three out of three meant you have typical angina, two out of three means it's atypical angina, and one out of three they classified as non-anginal. Uh, and uh, this is the, the table, the, these are the patients that they, they came up, uh, that they used to come up with this classification. And as you can see, patients who had all three uh, had a probability of about 93%. Uh, and then the prevalence after they went to the cath lab uh, was about 92% and it decreased as you had two out of three and one out of three. So nitroglycerin, just briefly uh, formulated for clinical use in the 1800s, 1879. Uh, it's the oldest and most commonly used short-acting anginal agent and the short-acting is, is used in patients with active angina and, and this is the topic of this uh, discussion. And then long-acting uh, agents are used in patients with stable CAD as part of their optimal uh, medical management as outpatients. So mechanism of action, uh, there's endothelial dysfunction in coronary artery disease, and that decreases the production of nitric oxide, which was previously known as endothelium-derived relaxing factor. Um, and then, uh, therefore, exogenous nitroglycerin uh, is converted to nitric oxide, and that essentially replenishes the deficient levels. And uh, it activates soluble guanylate cyclase, as you, you probably remember from physiology or biochemistry, that increase, increases your uh, cyclic GMP levels. And essentially, this leads to decrease in myocardial oxygen consumption uh, by doing a number of things, uh, reducing preload, afterload, systolic wall stress. It dilates both pre- and post-stenotic uh, uh, arteries. Uh, coronary arteries increases subendocardial perfusion, prevents coronary artery va vasospasm, et cetera. So obviously it's, it's uh, prudent to give patients who present to the ED nitroglycerin, and it's one of the most important initial in interventions you can make. Uh, however, uh, does the relief of chest pain with nit after nitroglycerin, does that always suggest uh, active coronary artery disease? And uh, not to spoil things right away, but the first paper I looked at uh, says chest pain relief with by nitroglycerin does not predict active coronary artery disease. Uh, this was a uh, prospective cohort, looked at 459 patients who presented to the ED with chest pain um, and received nitroglycerin, and that's the time period that they uh, used. 
So they got either 0.4 sublingual or uh, spray, uh, nitroglycerin spray. And some patients received more than one dose. However, only the response to the initial dose was assessed. And uh, they looked at their pain level right before and then five minutes after receiving that first dose of nitroglycerin. Uh, and then they defined chest pain relief as a 50% reduction uh, in pain level at five minutes as reported by the, the patient. And then uh, some other definitions, active CAD was the uh, appropriate symptom, so the chest pain uh, plus either elevated troponins, greater than 70% stenosis on cath, or a positive stress test. And then no active CAD essentially meant the, the opposite of these. So no troponin elevation um, uh, plus, you know, angiography without uh, significant stenosis and a negative uh, stress test, either exercise, uh, sorry, exercise with or without imaging. And then they were followed up for four months to look for uh, clinical status, other events, hospitalizations, et cetera. So uh, baseline characteristics, uh, of note, something I found interesting was uh, in patients who had no pain relief with nitroglycerin and had no CAD, there was about a 10% difference in the ones who did have pain relief. I just thought that was interesting. Um, and then the results, 459 patients, 39% of them had at least 50% chest pain relief, and uh, 61 did not. Now, there was no significant difference of the EKG findings in both, pa in both groups who were responsive and non-responsive. And then 31% uh, had active CAD, 60 did not, uh, and then 58 uh, were classified not having, as not having active CAD due to either no history uh, and no events during the follow-up, and then five patients uh, had a clear alternative explanation. Now, 35% of the 141 patients who had active CAD had relief with nitroglycerin. And then in the patients without CAD, 41% of them, a higher percentage, had chest pain relief with nitroglycerin. Uh, and then 9% uh, had basically pain that was unable to, to be determined, and they were ex excluded from the uh, calculations of the sensitivities and specificities. And then the four-month clinical outcomes were similar in both groups. So. Uh, some graphs to show you, the, the first thing we're looking at here is a sensitivity and specificity graph of all the patients and also uh, after uh, stratifying them into different uh, categories. And as you can see, patients with history of CAD, uh, right here the sensitivity was only about 30 or 28, 29 percent. Specificity was a little higher at around 55 or so percent. And then for the overall population, uh, slightly higher sensitivity and uh, a slightly lower specificity. And then also they did a graph of uh, calculating the, the likelihood ratios in the same subgroup analysis. And the important thing that I noted from this was that the confidence intervals, uh, you know, of all the likelihood ratios crosses one, and uh, that essentially tells you that, you know, uh, response to nitroglycerin had no positive or negative value in, in predicting active CAD. Um, so the, the, also they tried to see whether or not having different definitions of improvement of chest pain had any difference uh, in, the, in the accuracy. So they used percent reduction initially, uh, and then uh, the authors then attempted to see whether or not absolute reduction uh, would be any better. And um, so they did a ROC curves for these. Um, and uh, if you remember a good study, you want to be right up here. Uh, you have sensitivity at the top and one minus specificity here on the x-axis. So a good study would be high in both sensitivities and specificities right up here. And when they used uh, percent reduction, you can see there was really not, uh, it wasn't anywhere near uh, um, that area. And then also, when they used it as a uh, absolute reduction in chest pain, uh, they look almost identical. There's, there's really no, no good value uh, in doing so. So uh, regardless of the method in that study, the, the relief had no um, value in determining either the presence or absence of active uh, CAD. So the conclusion of the study was that, you know, chest pain relief with nitroglycerin does not accurately predict CAD, should not really be used as a triage tool, uh, although, you know, we always give it, and, and rightfully so. Uh, and then uh, the sensitivity and specificity is low even when you pre-specify the, the, the patients, the ones, even the ones with known CAD.
And then uh, even alternative definitions of pain couldn't really uh, help us in improving the, uh, the, the diagnostic performance of, of this. So another paper from the Canadian Journal of Emergency Medicine back in 2006 um, looked at similar, uh, did, did a similar study. They uh, basically was a prospective cohort, patients who had chest pain received nitroglycerin, um, and uh, basically was conducted in a uh, urban uh, ED setting, 3,500 annual visits for chest pain, 270 patients a little bit smaller than the prior study. Uh, who had chest pain received nitroglycerin every five minutes for three doses or until they had relief of pain. And then uh, they excluded some patients, obviously ones with a clear STEMI or ones that went straight to the cath lab. Uh, the, those patients were not included in the study. And then pain in this study was reported at from one to ten and five initially and then five minutes after. And uh, they classified them into risk categories based on their TIMI scores. Uh, patients were followed for four weeks after discharge from the hospital, and same thing, they assessed repeat hospitalizations, further events, etc. And the definitions in this study were somewhat similar, so response meant three or more points in the scale, uh, or com complete relief of the initial score was three, and then negative response basically meant failure of the above mentioned. Uh, cardiac chest pain was uh, defined as chest pain plus new EKG changes. Positive troponin over 0.3 mics per liter or 70% um, or greater stenosis on cardiac cath or a positive stress test. This is the table here uh, of the demographic data. And uh, prior known CAD in this study, patients who had chest pain relief were about, uh, where are we, right over here, were about 10% lower, which was kind of the opposite of the other paper, which I also thought was interesting. Uh, so the results here, 278 enrolled, eight were excluded, 66% had a positive response, 34 had a negative response, and then 34 um, who had relief with nitroglycerin had true cardiac chest pain, and then 66% who had relief had non-cardiac chest pain. 25% uh, of the patients who had no relief ended up actually having uh, cardiac chest pain. And then 75% of the patients who had no relief uh, had non-cardiac chest pain. Uh, and then the PCI and cabbage rates were not statistically different between those two studies, uh, between, sorry, the ones who did and the ones who did not respond to nitroglycerin. And then uh, based on this study, they found 72% sensitivity of nitroglycerin as a diagnostic test for chest pain with a 37% specificity, did not that great. Um, and then the positive likelihood ratio was only 1.1, and it crossed the, the, the confidence interval crossed one, again, uh, meaning that it's, it's not really that reliable. And then when they did a chi-squared test, um, it wasn't statistically significant when differentiating cardiac versus non-cardiac uh, chest pain. So the conclusion of this study was basically the same. Nitroglycerin did not prove useful in the diagnostic evaluation of someone who's having cardiac versus non-cardiac chest pain. Uh, the positive likelihood ratio uh, you know, suggests equal pre and post probabilities. And then relief of chest pain with nitroglycerin basically was concluded to be not reliable uh, and does not help distinguish between cardiac and non-cardiac chest pain. Uh, this was a meta-analysis. Um, it was a systematic review. Uh, it looked at five studies that dealt with this uh, topic. Two were the ones that I just talked about. And they had to be cohorts. Uh, and the initial management in all the studies had to have uh, include the administration of, of nitroglycerin. Um, and the outcome that they measured was the accuracy of nitroglycerin as a diagnostic uh, test. And they did that by calculating the sensitivities and specificities. Uh, so five studies were included, and uh, the, this review basically calculated the combined sensitivity and specificity to be 52 and 49 percent respectively, so it was almost like a coin toss essentially. Uh, and the odds ratio ra ranged from 0.76 to 1.8. The confidence intervals of all except one uh, ended up crossing the null value. Um, and the overall combined uh, odds ratio was 1.2, again, crossing the, the null value and, and was not deemed to be statistically significant.
So they concluded uh, use of nitroglycerin as a test of treatment had really poor accuracy. Um, four out of the five studies failed to show uh, the ability to differentiate between cardiac and non-cardiac chest pain. Uh, and essentially it was a, deemed to be an unreliable uh, diagnostic tool. Uh, for these patients, for the ones who show up to the emergency room with chest pain and you're trying to find out whether or not this is active CAD or not. Uh, I wanted to include this also. This is a table that I found on UpToDate and uh, it has the clinical features that increase the probability of MI in patients who present with chest pain and you have all these different categories. So chest pain uh, or left arm and then chest pain radiation, either right shoulder, left arm, both, left and right arm. Chest pain is the most important symptom, history of MI, nausea or vomiting, diaphoresis, third heart sound, hypotension, and crackles. And uh, just wanted to see uh, what do you guys think has the highest likelihood ratio if you were to take a guess? Left arm, okay. The other ones? S3. S3, okay. Surprisingly, and I was, I was really surprised by this, it's actually um, radiation to both the left and right arm had a likelihood ratio of about 7.1. Uh, and then, yeah, coming in second was the uh, S3 or third heart sound, but uh, the, the likelihood ratio was much lower at 3.2. Um, so I thought that was kind of really interesting because I, had, I hadn't known about it before. Uh, and then the rest, you have hypotension had a likelihood ratio of 3.1, and then to the left arm, as we classically know, was 2.9. So take-home points. Uh, relief of chest pain with nitroglycerin, I found, does not uh, reliably distinguish cardiac versus non-cardiac causes of chest pain. Uh, I didn't mention this in the talk, but I included it here. Uh, nitroglycerin often uh, relieves pain related to esophageal spasm. So if you have someone without the risk factors, without the history of CAD, who has chest pain and does respond, that's a differential to kind of think about. Uh, it's important to take into account atypical presentations um, in diabetics, women, and elderly, especially because those patients do worse due to a delay in diagnosis. And then certain characteristics of chest pain uh, increase the likelihood, as we just saw. Uh, and it's also extremely important to inquire that if a patient has had prior or similar chest pain, whether or not it was reminiscent, um, the chest pain that was due to active uh, CAD. And these are my references. Any uh, comments? I'm sure Dr. Gelberg, but we'll get to you in a minute. Uh, do you know if nitro has any improvement in mortality in CAD? They, the studies I looked at didn't look at uh, whether or not, like all the primary outcomes looked at the uh, sensitivity, specificities, like the ratios. that question? I'm curious about. In heart failure. What is it? Coronary disease? With, with hydralazine, but no. So uh, the placebo effect is powerful because of the name. You tell someone you're giving them nitroglycerin, it has a very potent sound to it. So the placebo effect is very real. That's, that's one issue with nitroglycerin. The other is I'd be curious to see whether they use tablets or spray. So most of them were the 0.4 milligram sublingual tablets. One of the studies used uh, both, either the tablet or the spray. Clearly, nitroglycerin is effective in people with ischemic disease. The question that we wanted to examine, because it has also been used to some extent diagnostically, is relief of chest pain with nitroglycerin is diagnostic of ischemic coronary artery disease. That is what a lot of people have thought in the past. Um, and clearly, from the evidence presented, I don't think that this is true. That doesn't mean you shouldn't give somebody with chest pain nitroglycerin, right? because it, if that is the cause of their chest pain, it will help them, okay? So this is the question of what we're gonna be, uh, the myth or the statement. So how many believe that uh, this statement is true, that it, nitroglycerin is diagnostic of active ischemic coronary artery disease? How many think it's plausible? How many think it's busted? Okay. okay.